Hello everybody, in this video we're going to explain the concepts of stoichiometry as it pertains to chemical reactions, use balanced chemical equations to derive stoichiometric factors relating the amounts of reactants of products, and we're going to perform some stoichiometric calculations converting between mass, moles, and uh, molarity. So first off, what is reaction stoichiometry? Um, we know that a balanced chemical reaction provides a great deal of information in a very succinct format. All right? The chemical formulas that are in there provide the identities of the reactants and the products involved in the chemical change. The coefficients provide the relative numbers of these chemical species. And we saw that before with their example with our model uh, reaction. The quantitative relationships between the amounts of reactants and products these are what are known as the reaction stoichiometry. And from that stoichiometry, we can figure out the stoichiometric factors that we need to convert between uh, different chemical species. Um, and the way that we do this is very similar to a recipe. All right. So from a balanced chemical reaction, we can determine the amount of one reactant required to react with a given amount of another reactant and the amount of reactant needed to yield a given amount of product. The coefficients in the balanced equation are used to derive stoichiometric factors that permit computation of the desired quantity. So let's look at an example and see if we can parse out what all that language really meant. All right, so in, for instance, um, Let's think about if we were given a recipe, and this recipe is for making eight pancakes. It calls for one cup of pancake mix and three quarters cup of milk and one egg. So if I'm going to write this in the language of chemistry, I'm going to say I'm going to add one cup mix, three quarters cup milk, one egg. I'm going to be able to produce eight pancakes. But what happens if I don't want to make eight pancakes? What if I want to make two dozen pancakes? All right, the amount of ingredients must be increased proportionally. All right, so I can't just increase one of these ingredients and then make 12 pancakes. The ratio between them has to stay the same. All right, if for instance, I wanted to know how many eggs I wanted to make to make two dozen pancakes, well, I'm gonna take 24 pancakes, I'm gonna divide it by eight eggs or eight pancakes, okay? And if you think about what that value is, it's basically three, right? 24 divided by eight is gonna be three, right? I'm trying to make three times as many pancakes. I'm gonna multiply that by the number of eggs it took to make one pancake, and I'm gonna see that I need three eggs, all right? So to make three times the number of pancakes, I'm gonna need three times the number of eggs. But mathematically, it works out like this, and we can see that our units cancel, and that we gain the unit of eggs. We can apply that just as easily to a chemical uh, equation. All right. This equation shows that ammonia molecules are produced from hydrogen molecules in a 2 to 3 ratio. Right. So I need 3 hydrogen molecules to produce 2 ammonium, uh, ammonia molecules. Stoichiometric factors may be derived using any amount number unit. All right, so you can have two molecules of ammonia for every three molecules of hydrogen. You can have two dozen ammonia molecules for three dozen ammonia uh, hydrogen molecules, or you could have two moles, which is what we're ultimately trying to get at, of ammonia molecules for three moles of hydrogen molecules. All right. So we can use these coefficients not only to determine the ratios of atoms that we need, but the ratio of moles that we need. And we know that the mole allows us to easily figure out mass, right? Because it's a cleverly chose unit. Let's look at another little example here. How many moles of I2 are required to react with 0.429 moles of aluminum according to the following reaction? All right, and they actually have a picture of this in your book. It's, it's quite spectacular. Uh, aluminum is a powder solid. You don't really think of aluminum as being reactive, but in its powdered form, it's quite reactive. 
iodine is a solid you put it in a little pile there it starts to react quite vigorously releasing a lot of heat and then ultimately like has like a combustion type reaction and some of the uh, iodine gets vaporized and it turns into this uh, purple cloud that's uh, quite beautiful and super duper toxic so don't do that at home so to answer this question we're going to go from the moles of aluminum that we knew to the moles of iodine and how many that we need. From our stoichiometry, we know that for every two moles of aluminum, we need three moles of iodine. So I have my stoichiometric factor here. I cancel my moles of aluminum and I do my math here, which would be 0 0.429 times three divided by two. And I can see that I'm going to need 0.644 moles of iodine. All right, so by interpreting this equation, I was able to come up with the stoichiometric factor that had the moles of what I was being asked for in the question and the numerator and the moles of what I needed to cancel in the denominator and then determine the moles of iodine that I needed. Let's look at another question here that's a little trickier because now we're not going to be given moles directly. What mass of sodium hydroxide, NaOH, would be required to produce 16 grams of the, of the antacid milk of magnesia, magnesium hydroxide, by the following reaction? So we're given this reaction. We have magnesium chloride plus sodium hydroxide is going to produce magnesium hydroxide plus two sodium chlorides table salt. All right, so what were we given in the problem? We're given that we want to produce 16 grams of the magnesium hydroxide, and we're being asked how much sodium hydroxide do I need to weigh out. I've not been given moles anywhere. In a problem like that, your instinct should always be to immediately take the mass that you were given and convert it to moles. So we're going to take the mass of sodium of magnesium hydroxide. We're going to convert it to moles right away. All right. Then we're going to use a stoichiometric factor to get to the moles of sodium hydroxide. And then we're going to convert that over to the mass of sodium hydroxide. A lot of students will try and find some direct relationship from the mass of magnesium hydroxide directly to the mass of sodium hydroxide. It does not exist. Okay, the problem will always be to convert over to moles, do your stoichiometry, convert back to mass. All right, so I have my 16 grams of magnesium hydroxide. I know that I need to divide by the molar mass, putting the grams of magnesium hydroxide in the denominator. Again, I determine this number by adding up the atomic ma masses of all the atoms in magnesium hydroxide. I know that one mole of magnesium hydroxide is going to weigh 58.3 grams. I put the grams in the denominator to cancel the grams from the problem. I now am in moles of magnesium hydroxide. That would be this step. Then I need to use my stoichiometric factor. I go back to my problem. I see that I produce one magnesium hydroxide mole for every two moles of sodium hydroxide that I consumed. So. I have two moles of sodium hydroxide that's in the numerator because that's what I'm being asked for ultimately is about sodium hydroxide. This is what I want to retain. What I want to cancel is going to be the moles of magnesium. I put that in the denominator. I'm getting these factors from the coefficients in the problem. That would be this step. Now I need to convert from the moles of sodium hydroxide over to the mass of sodium hydroxide this time I want to multiply by the molar mass and it's not the same molar mass as magnesium hydroxide I'm now in moles of sodium hydroxide so I need to multiply by the molar mass of sodium hydroxide I go and look up sodium oxygen and hydrogen I add them together I see that it's 40 grams per mole of sodium hydroxide I cancel my sodium hydroxide I do the multiplication times 40 and I ultimately get out 22 grams of sodium hydroxide. All right. 
um, it is useful to instead of doing each one of these steps as separate mathematical formulas to start to learn to chain these together and keep track of your units as you go along uh, to make sure that you're doing it right that way you can kind of just type out one big long thing into your calculator to get out the correct answer now there are many many ways that this could these types of questions can be asked we really can't go through all the different type of stoichiometry problems that are possible right now um, and you could be given a lot of different information you could be given volume and density you could be given mass you could be given solution concentrations and volume uh, any of these if you are given the information to find moles though then you can uh, be asked a stoichiometric uh, problem from that type, that information. I really like this uh, graphic here because it really kind of demonstrates the different things that you could start off knowing um, and what you're going to be able to, uh, what additionally you're going to need to know in order to go uh, along a flow chart and do a stoichiometric problem. Regardless of if you start off with uh, volume and density or volume and concentration or number of particles, it doesn't really matter. You're always going, or even if you had mass starting out, you're always going to go to moles. You're going to apply the correct stoichiometric factor, and then you're going to work your way backwards to give you whatever you're being asked for in the problem. All right, so this is a... It's a good thing to have out in front of you when you're trying to think about how to solve these types of problems.